Mullet, A Tale of Two Fish is made possible by the West Coast Inland Navigation District, the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program, and the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel. Support for WGCU's local productions comes from the estate of Patrick and Rosalie LaSala and from generous contributions by viewers like you. Thank you. Did you eat mullet? Mullet? No. 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 No, I can't even stand the looks of it. Should we eat mullet? mullet? Uh, no. Don't eat the mullet. No. no. You're supposed to throw it. I couldn't eat it, sorry. No, we didn't even realize mullet was a fish. We just thought it was a haircut. So what's become of the poor mullet? How did this proud and plentiful fish a fish still considered a valuable food source in many parts of the world becomes such a mullet non grata, especially here in Florida. Why did the mullet go from dependable staple to pitiful bait fish? How did such a good fish get such a bad name? To find answers to these fishy questions, we'll begin by exploring the mullet's historical significance throughout the world, the American South, and ultimately, the mullet's importance right here in Florida. We'll examine the mullet's habitat, their migration, and why many people consider mullet from Florida's west coast to be some of the best tasting in the world. We'll witness the dramatic rise of the mullet's commercial fishery throughout the 20th century, and how Florida's contentious gillnet ban impacted the mullet industry, as well as the fishing communities that had netted mullet for generations. We'll look at what the future might hold for this underappreciated fish and visit with some Florida entrepreneurs that are hoping to create a mullet renaissance. So is it the mullet's destiny to be forever considered just another garbage fish? Or is it perhaps the fish of the future? Trash or treasure, the mullet is truly a tale of two fish. So what is a mullet anyway? And I'm only going to say this once, not the haircut, the fish. And not just any fish, it's the jumping fish. The mullet, a fish so ingrained into the culture of Florida that it is celebrated annually at festivals across the state. From Niceville, to Matt Lachey, just throw it as hard as you can, Sean. Whoa, what a good throw. No! Oh. To Goodland. Heck, even the local newspaper in Everglades City is named the Mullet Wrapper. But what is it really? What kind of fish is a mullet? Mullet in general are sort of torpedo shaped. They're, they're shaped like a, a strong swimming fish. And of course, if they're migrating 100 miles offshore, they gotta be good swimmers. They've got large scales. Um, they do have two dorsal fins, which is not that common among fish. So it, it tends to get them classified with other things that have two dorsal fins, uh, barracuda being one of them, um, silver sides being another. The number of rays in those dorsal fins can help separate the species. And uh, the genus Mugle, which is all but one of our species, when they get um, 
hole, a couple inches long at least. They develop an adipose eyelid. It's semi, they're sorry, I guess you'd say translucent tissue, fairly thick. Uh, it closes off part of their, their, um, their eyeball. You know, they can still see through it, but it's just got a smaller opening in it. But the mugle all have that adipose eyelid. They got a very strange looking mouth. It's usually described as triangular and the teeth are not very, uh, not anything to write home about at all. Their teeth are very small and they're, they're not using their teeth for much, so that makes sense. To state the size range of mullet, you have to uh, be uh, species specific. Does striped mullet get bigger than the others? I believe some records would take them up to three feet long, but that's gotta be really rare. Two feet long is probably a normal maximum size. White mullet a little bit smaller than that, and uh, fantail mullet are a little bit smaller than that. Even. You know, and that's the reason that uh, striped mullet have been more prominent in the fishery, they're bigger, and, uh, and, and females have uh, a lot more row in them, you know, so it makes more sense to harvest them. All fish pass a current of water through their mouth and out over the gills to breathe. Well, also on the inside of gill arches, fish have things called gill rakers, and that filters out particles, because they're, if they're breathing in water, they're gonna breathe in particles. Well, some fish just do that to get rid of things that they don't want, but some fish do it to filter out things that they wanna eat and mullet are one of them. And so they, they can filter particles out of this mud and then they've got a gizzard that they grind it all up with. A lot of that is, is plant material. Um, uh, it, some of it can be animal, um, but uh, most people would say they're more heavily on the vegetarian side. In fact, that, that gizzard, uh, that's a, a very interesting story. When I first got here, uh, it's when they were trying to pass more and more laws about the mullet fishery and there was a man that brought a court case and it actually, I guess, made it to court because somebody here had to go testify um, claiming that fisheries regulations could not apply to mullet because they have a gizzard, therefore they're birds. <laughs> Netted in the warm coastal waters of most tropical and subtropical zones throughout the world, mullet are found in the Western Atlantic Ocean from Nova Scotia, Canada, south to Brazil, including the Gulf of Mexico. In the eastern Atlantic Ocean, the striped mullet occurs from the Bay of Biscay in France to South Africa, including the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. The eastern Pacific Ocean range includes Southern California south to Chile. In addition to the striped mullet of America's Gulf Coast, the leaner silver mullet frequents the Atlantic coast of Florida. However, in some cases, a mullet is not a mullet. For example, the red mullet, or roger, found primarily in the Mediterranean, is actually a goatfish and not a mullet at all. Europeans have fished for mullet since the time of the ancient Greeks. Called mugle by the Romans, Mullet, to this day, remains a culinary mainstay throughout the Mediterranean. Mullet is a popular food source in Hawaii and Japan and throughout Asia as well, where female mullet are coveted for their egg sacs, or roe. In America, the mullet has always been considered primarily a southern fish and found along the coasts of the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and here in Florida. So you've probably heard that mullet is a urihaline fish. That means it can withstand various salinities from full strength seawater, and in mullet's case, all the way down to pure fresh water. And its life cycle is kind of built around the strategy of spawning in the sea and then growing up in the estuary and in fresh water in particular. So the juveniles, the larvae actually, sort of make their way towards the coast and and then the juveniles tend to settle out in lower salinity water so not sure exactly what the cues are that move them in that direction it could be salinity it could be the nutrients that they're seeking but for whatever reason they are moving steadily towards lower and lower salinity as juveniles and then they'll grow up to where they get they they grow around maybe eight to nine inches in total length a year so that um, by the time they're two to three years old they're mature and and they're getting ready to spawn and in Florida 
they begin to spawn in the early fall, October, and they spawn through January. And the main months are November and December. And when they spawn, they tend to school up and move offshore to the deeper water where they spawn. And at that time, the fishery is very active because as you can imagine, when they're schooling together, they're a bit easier to catch. So they cannot spawn this species in freshwater. They actually must go out to sea to spawn. If you look at the goals before the regulations began in the 90s, there was concern that the spawning population size was well below what was considered sustainable. And in Florida, we have a statistic we call the spawning potential ratio. It's essentially a proxy for the amount of mullet in the water needed in order to sustain that fishery. And the best guess is around 35%. In the late 80s and really early 90s, it, the best estimates were that it was down around 26%. So the regulations were geared towards bringing that population up to the spawning potential ratio at or above 35%. The state has been hugely successful in, in doing that. In, in part because of the citizens initiative and the net ban that the state put in place. And you know that that spawning potential ratio now is about 45 to 50 percent. So it's well above the level that would be considered you know needed for sustainability. Thousands of years before the appearance of European explorers, the sandy southwestern coast of Florida was home to the mighty Calusa Indians. Unlike other Native American tribes, the Calusa culture was centered on fishing, not farming. They survived off the waters, thriving on a diet consisting of fish and shellfish, with mullet as an important food source. The Calusa fishing was primarily based on net fishing and stationary weirs with stakes in the estuary's shallow water. Using nets made from palm fibers, the Calusas would catch mullet along the shoreline. You could say that the Calusa were the Gulf Coast's original net fishermen. In fact, Spanish explorer Lopez de Velasco, upon arriving in southwest Florida, noted that there was a great fishery of mullet, which the Indians catch in nets, as in Spain. By the early 1700s, however, the Calusa were nearly wiped out, victims of European diseases and overrun by Creek Indians fleeing English raiders in North Florida and Georgia. By the mid-1700s, the mullet fisheries of coastal Cuba had been fished heavily for more than a century and were severely depleted. In search of new waters, the Cubans journeyed north to the untouched Florida Gulf Coast with expansive bays that created the perfect environment for inshore net fishing, the technique favored by Cuban fishermen. Unlike the Calusa, the Cuban fishermen only fished in the winter when the mullet were fat and full of roe. The Cubans were here for only one season of the year and did not live in southwest Florida year-round. However, they were the first true commercial fishermen in the area, working the waters from Tampa Bay to Pine Island Sound. Encampments soon sprung up all along the Gulf Coast. These part-time settlements, called ranchos, consisted of primitive and makeshift huts clustered in the back bays and islands all along the coast. One rancho was located on the northern tip of Cayo Costa and operated by the Padilla family, whose descendants continued to live and fish on the island until the 1970s. By the late 1800s, the railroads and fish ice revolutionized Southwest Florida's fishing industry. Fishermen would bring their mullet to the fish houses to be put on ice and delivered to the railhead, where they would be packed into boxcars in alternating layers of fish and crushed ice. At the end of the 19th century, when the railroad line was extended south to Punta Gorda, the first commercial shipment north was mullet. 17 boxcars of them salted for the New York market. The mullet fisheries of Charlotte Harbor and Pine Island Sound might not have created vast fortunes, but they did help pay the bills for hundreds of families. During World War II, Florida produced record amounts of mullet for the war effort. 
with over 50 million pounds netted and added to the nation's food supply. Along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts, hundreds of companies geared up to meet the increasing demand for Florida seafood, a demand that continued to grow after the war. In 1947, President Truman announced a plan to help a devastated post-war Europe. By saving on meat and poultry products here in America, he reasoned, we subsequently save on grain. So he called on Americans not to eat meat on Tuesdays and to abstain from eating poultry or eggs on Thursday. Floridians quickly rallied around President Truman's Meatless Tuesday and cleverly branded mullet as Truman Turkey, the perfect meat substitute. The Gulf has supplied the majority of striped mullet in the United States since at least the 1960s, about 82% of the total U.S. mullet harvest. The statewide commercial catch of mullet between the years 1987 and 2001 was 232.9 million pounds, with a dollar value of over $115.2 million. And nets continued to be the mainstay of the now booming fishing industry. One of the most effective nets for catching mullet was called a gill net, or entangling net, which was specifically designed in various mesh sizes to catch, or gill, only certain sizes of fish. Fish too small could swim through the net, while fish too big could bounce off. By the late 80s, however, the price for the mullet's prize row climbed to over $11 a pound, causing a run on the market. Part-timer speculators and out-of-state fishermen looking for a quick jackpot soon descended on the Florida Gulf to compete with the locals for the valuable row. Greed set in, and the coastal bays became overrun with mullet boats, while the discarded male fish began washing up along the shores and canals. State officials, along with a coalition of recreational fishermen, were concerned that the mullet fishery, an important food source for game fish, might be irreparably damaged, and decided to act. And in 1994, Florida residents voted in one of the most contentious fisheries management decisions in state history. After much debate between commercial and recreational fishing interests over the reasons and remedies for declining fish populations, the voters of Florida approved a constitutional amendment that effectively eliminated the use of gill and other entangling nets within inshore state waters. Commonly referred to as the net ban, the amendment affected thousands of commercial fishermen across the state of Florida, who now had to adapt to new gear, invest in other fisheries, or abandon fishing altogether. But one unmistakable result was that a way of life that had been handed down for generations was now an outbound tide. My name is Karen Bell. I am an owner of Starfish Company, an owner with my uncle of AP Bellfish Company. Our family goes pretty far back on my dad's side. Um, they hailed from North Carolina, both my grandmother and grandfather. My grandmother is one of the original Fulford children. There were nine of them. She was actually born here in 1900. And then Aaron, my grandfather, was actually born in Carteret County, North Carolina. And he had nine siblings also. Um, he moved here in the late 1800s and then he wed my grandmother, Jessie, in I believe about 1920. So the history goes way back. Originally when they came here, a lot of why they were here was because of mullet. There was a big Cuban trade, the mullet were salted, and there was trade going back and forth from Cuba. But um, mullet today, I would say, is maybe 40% of what we do. In the 90s, there was a lot of political pressure to curtail the, the mullet harvest, mainly due to um, sports fishermen thought that it was hurting the food chain by removing so many from the fishery. In 95, the net ban was voted. That put a huge cut into the harvest rate. I think it went to half. I know our sales at AP Bell went to half, which was a, a big drop for us to sustain. A, a lot of the smaller companies along the coast, they just closed up. That's why there's so few little fish houses left anymore. It was more like the spirit almost of the people here was kind of broken. I mean, some of them basically retired. Some of them weren't went to land 
jobs in town at Tropicana. They went to the glass factory, but um, it, it was a it was a hard hard time. It's very difficult. The interesting things what is that I've seen happen in Florida as we have more of an influx of people from other areas of the country moving here, they don't appreciate mullet like Southerners do. Like we still sell lots and lots of the frozen nailfish. They go to North Carolina, they go to Georgia, they go in Central Florida. So that's like the more Southerners that really appreciate mullet. The, and mullet's a really good fish for you. It's got the high oil content. I mean, most of my family, they've lived to almost 90. And I attribute it honestly to they eat a lot of seafood, most of which is mullet. It's more known around the world than it is in the United States. I've gone down to Brazil and they produce um, millions and millions of pounds of mullet down there. And every home, that it's a staple. They grill mullet, they have little barbecues and they grill them right in their houses. Um, we sh we've shipped to Chile, to Romania, Haiti, Venezuela, all over the place where it's, it's appreciated and it's inexpensive, so it's even more appreciated. But um, unfortunately, the U.S. doesn't seem to have that market. And honestly, if you're a seafood, a true seafood eater would like mullet because it's really good. Fried's the best, but it's probably not the best for you, but the blackened and grilled are just, they're amazing. I, I do not understand it, but it, people in the, the, the main part of the country consider it a trash fish. And I don't know who started that nasty rumor, but they're wrong. North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, they're big mullet eaters. But the majority, I think we shipped 400,000 pounds of the male fish this year went to Egypt. I'd say 200,000 went to North Carolina. Last year, I believe we did a little over a million pounds of mullet in a one month period, which is a lot. And we were tired. <laughs> Fishermen were tired, but, but it's fun. I mean, everyone gets excited because it's the big mullet run, and everyone likes that. Um, I'm proud of what our fishermen do, and I'm proud of what our fish house does. We do a really nice job with the roe that we process and the fish that we process. Um, my hope, I always say to anybody, is that this company, it's been here now since 1940, you know, I, I hope it's here another 100 years or another 75 years, and hopefully mullet will be a part of that because it's important to not only the fish house and the fishermen, it's important to this community. Cortez is really unique, and a lot of that is because what has taken place here over the years. That little fish house there, it was built with mullet. You know, mullet's what did, did all that. These people are resilient, and they'll probably be here for a long, long time, the hardcore original families, and hopefully they'll still be catching mullet. However they're allowed to, they'll do it. My name's Michael Dooley. I'm a commercial fisherman, second generation, born and raised here in Boquilla. My dad was born in Bugger Grand, then he moved to Pine Island. He had eight kids and a wife to support, and he did it by fishing, mullet fishing. Done it his whole lifetime. And he was very good at it. Back in them days, you only had uh, Briggs and Stratton's, end boards, eight horse, which was a big motor back then, and towed a skiff. And, uh, he uh, supported his whole family, commercial mullet fishing. I fished with my father, and then he built me a boat when I was 12, and I went on my own, caught mullet. I made money to buy my school clothes, you know, buy nets, basically do whatever we wanted to do with it. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was a lot of money if you didn't have any. Back then we used pole skivs a lot, where you had to net on a boat that didn't have a motor, and you'd pole around them and you'd tow out with a, an inboard motor. And then we evolved into uh, the outboard motors. And uh, we put a 15 horse motor on it, outboard on it. And I thought it needed wings because it went so much faster than the, <laughs> the actual inboard. And uh, then we got from a 15, we built a little bigger boat. You go to a 40 horse, which was a lot of horsepower back then. But now they have them up to 150 horse, you know. I'd fish after school, and then uh, on the weekends we fished, and then after I got out of school, graduated from school, I went in at full time, then I, I got married, and I supported a family of four catching mullet. We ate a lot of mullet, different kinds of dishes. Fishermen founded this island. They used to be uh, probably 200 fishing families on this island, but after the net limitation, um, they just couldn't make it. You know, they, they just folded up because uh, 
they had to get into something different. You know, and you used to go on an average day and see 20 or 30 commercial boats. And uh, last week I went fishing uh, four days and never seen another commercial boat. The only catching mullet this day and age is, is kind of a rough game. A young man can't do it, can't support a family. There was 10 in our family, dad did it, you know, but I had uh, a son and a daughter and a wife to support. But after the net limitation, there's no way I could have paid my bills just mullet fishing. You gotta get into different things. You know, you have to work harder. They give us a net that we have to stay on the water longer to try to catch the fish we're after. If we just had a little bigger mash, we could catch our fish in two, three hours, come home. But the two inch mash, we have to stay all day to get the three or 400 we need. You know, it doesn't make sense. They don't want us out there, but yet they give us something that keeps us out there. <laughs> well, I, I mullet fish about three days a week in the summer. From, from May to November, you're gonna be on the limit where we can only catch a certain amount per day, like 300, 400 pounds a day, three days a week. You, you can strike a lot of fish and only get a few, you know, 20 or 30 head. So it's, it's an all-day job sometimes to get what you need. And then we cast net, you know, there, if the tides are right, we cast net. We have a two-inch seine, we use the two-inch seine when the tides are right for the seine. But it's a young man's game. Cast netting's a young man's game, I can tell you that. Mullet's really got a bad rep. They, a lot of people think it's a bait fish but it's an excellent eating fish. We smoke it, we fry it, we uh, can it, bake it, and it's an excellent eating fish. We've had fish fries and people said, I don't eat mullet. And we give them a sample and they'd buy a dinner to eat and take a dinner home with them. So it's educating them on how really good it is. So it's all good. Oh, there's plenty of mullet in this area. It always has been. Actually, I work as much as I can. No, as much as they let me go, I'll go. It's a good life, healthy life. My name's Shane Dooley. I'm a third generation Pine Island commercial fisherman, seafood producer. Love mullet fishing. I'd rather mullet fish more than anything. Usually leave early in the morning, you know, get your day going good. As a kid, I fished with dad. I was still in diapers on his boat, you know. I fished with my dad. I just grew up fishing and loved it. He built me a boat like his dad built him a boat. He built me a boat when I was young and got a couple of my buddies and well, nothing better in the world. Freedom. Get out there and fish and do whatever you want to do and just fish all over. You know, it was, it was a good life and I loved it.
There's no doubt that the historic fishing communities along the coast of Florida represent the mullet's past, and for the most part, they also reflect the fishery's present condition. But what does the future hold for the mullet? Will the mullet be forever viewed as merely a seasonal catch with marginal yields, harvested primarily for its profitable red roe, while the fish itself remains only a local delicacy in and around the coastal fishing villages? Or is there a brighter future? A future where the mullet not only feeds the fisherman's family, but also feeds hungry families throughout the world. We're currently at seven billion people on the planet. It's predicted to be up at nine billion people in 2050. So it's growing quite rapidly. And as that happens, we're going to need more protein. And that protein is going to come from fish. There's no doubt about it, we cannot produce the protein we need in land-based systems. We don't have the land available and we don't have the fresh water available to be able to produce that. So future protein, both plant and animal, is gonna come from the sea. And so where is that gonna come from? It's gonna come from, hopefully, sustainable aquaculture. And mullet should be a part of that. It's a wonderful fish to eat. It is low on the trophic level in terms of what we need to feed it. So we can feed it a diet that is much less expensive to produce. And when you're feeding it this commercial diet, you can have all this great enhancement to it with algae, which will make it a really sustainable seafood source. One of the things that we really need in this country is to produce more of the seafood that we consume. Today, we import over 91% of the seafood that we eat. That imported seafood is coming from both commercial fishing and aquaculture, but today, over 50% of the seafood that's eaten around the world is produced in aquaculture. And yet, in our country, we're currently only producing about 5% of the aquacultured seafood that's consumed. So what we really need to do is look at opportunities to produce more seafood in our own country for local consumption. So say a fish like mullet could be produced in both ways. We could increase the stocks and fish more and provide more of that fish as part of the seafood that's consumed here in Florida. Of a great fish. It's a local species. It's available in our waters, but there isn't a lot of it available on our current restaurant menus, mostly because the main species that you see out there are the ones that are cultured in countries around the world and then imported into our country. The biggest examples are salmon and tilapia. Both of those fish 99% of them are produced in aquaculture and imported into the United States, and they're on every restaurant menu that you would go to see. The other thing is that we could aquaculture mullet. That's another opportunity for uh, Florida farms as well as other places in the southeastern U.S. where they could produce those fish in hatcheries and then stock them into ponds and grow them out for market. In the U.S., we've resisted the development of aquaculture because first, we aren't a fish-eating nation, and because second, we are concerned about the environmental impacts. But aquaculture in the ocean is moving in new directions, and it's a real exciting direction. One of them is offshore aquaculture, and they, they use these huge ocean cages, and they're producing a variety of different fishes that way. The prediction is that in the future that 75, 80, maybe even 90 percent of the seafood that's consumed worldwide will be produced in aquaculture. And the reason is our population is growing and our commercial fisheries can only support the same level of fishing that they support today in the future. We call it the maximum sustainable yield for commercial fishing. We reached that in the 1990s, and we reached it at 90 million metric tons. And so that is the largest amount of commercial fishing that can happen without depleting the wild fisheries. We see that there have been a variety of different impacts that have happened on wild fisheries due to human population growth. Everything from industrial pollution to things like the oil spill that happened in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico.
So those sorts of things impact wild fisheries and we don't know to what extent those fisheries will continue to be able to be maintained at that 90 million metric ton level. We certainly hope it will. But even if we could do that, our population is growing. So, if it's possible to increase the output of Florida's mullet fisheries through a creative combination of commercial fishing and aquaculture, what then? How does all this fish get to the people, to the stores, the restaurants, the food distributors? Chris Kogan might have a solution. He and his team were the 2015 winners of the Gulf Coast Innovation Challenge, a $500,000 competitive grant opportunity designed to inspire and fund innovative solutions to issues and opportunities facing Florida's Gulf Coast region with a focus on marine science and growing the region's blue economy. Well, the Gulf Coast Community Challenge is a uh, very exciting uh, program and we're thrilled to be a part of it. Um, our mullet project had already uh, begun about a year before and we thought it would be a perfect project to uh, submit for it. The United States has an 11 billion dollar seafood deficit. That's one of the top deficits we have after oil. The state of Florida alone imports 2.6 billion dollars of seafood a year. So if we can capture a small percentage of that, we have a very significant business. So our objective was to uh, create a state-of-the-art processing facility and ultimately what will become a MSC or Marine Stewardship Council certification of our Gulf mullet fishery. Marine Stewardship Council certification, it's a globally recognized organization and that is the certification that most of the responsible retailers, uh, your Whole Foods, Publix, etc., will look for. So our objective was to uh, create a state-of-the-art processing facility uh, to give us the capacity and the technology to do a lot of the things that we would like to do with the fish, including create uh, omega-3 fish oil, perhaps smoke the fillets to add value to them, creating fish feed for aquaculture out of the remainder of the fish, the carcass and what have you, that's not really usable for any human consumption. If you're going to be taking fish from the water, you want to utilize as much of that fish as possible. When we hired our engineers and architects for this processing facility, we wanted them to engage with the local fishermen and find out what we can do in designing this facility to make their jobs much more efficient. And that's one of the things that we hope to change. By creating a multi-use processing facility, we will be busy 12 months out of the year. We'll be the first company that I'm aware of uh, in the United States to offer equity ownership in this business to the fishermen to help incentivize them. We know that we're gonna pay market price for the fish to get the fish, but the add of incentive of having equity that they can build for their family and pass down to their children, and ultimately, if the company has an exit or goes public or whatever, that can wind up being a big incentive to those fishermen. The gillnet ban helped the mullet fishery, so we now today have a very sustainable, healthy mullet fishery. So for us to uh, approach this from a standpoint of rebuilding a, a you know, marine economy, rebuilding the seafood economy, the fishing economy uh, in, in Sarasota, in Florida, or the Gulf, um, the potential is there. One of our partners is one of the largest you know, seafood broker distributors in the United States. So we already have, they have accounts already with 3,000 of the 3,500 grocery stores in, the, in America. So that enables us to not just get the fish that we produce out there into the supply chain, but it enables us to meet and speak to those retailers before we ever grow the first fish. We want to use this local project here in Sarasota, Manatee as a pilot, an example of what can be done with various species, including clams, oysters, perhaps grouper, sardines, you name it. So, through a synergistic combination of commercial fishing and aquaculture, a massive increase of mullet into the marketplace can potentially be realized. 
with state-of-the-art processing facilities that can quickly distribute the fish to the stores, the restaurants, and the food distributors. But how can mullet be made popular again? How can the demand for this wonderful fish be increased? Meet some mullet missionaries, three visionary entrepreneurs that are singing the praises of all things mullet and doing their part to convert the public's eating habits by embracing the unlimited potential of the mighty mullet. Seth Kripe grew up in and around the Cortez area, where many of his boyhood friends are now themselves commercial fishermen. At the age of 17, Seth moved to California's Napa Valley to seek his fortune as a winemaker. But his heart remained in old Cortez, and he remained in close contact with his childhood friends back home in Florida. Every year, every winter, I, I was finishing harvest in Napa Valley, and I would talk to my friends, the mullet season was starting, everybody was excited for mullet season, but then they would get upset because the price came out at 60 cents a pound and they weren't getting paid much money, so everybody had a hard time with that. It was 2007, I was finishing harvest and I was going to dinner with a few people uh, at a restaurant in Napa Valley called the French Laundry, which is one of the world's best restaurants. The waiter came over for one of the courses and shaved and had this piece of mullet row uh, and shaved this grated it like Parmesan cheese over this pasta course and said this is salt cured mullet roe from Sardinia, from Italy. Uh, it's a very rare uh, delicacy. And so immediately like this light bulb went off to me. This is what they're making the roe out of that we sell overseas and we have forever uh, in, and they're serving it at this amazing restaurant here. So that kind of sparked this whole thing and from that point on I wanted to know everything there is to know about mullet roe we need to make this here, add the value, pay you guys more money, it's $300 a pound, you're getting paid 60 cents a pound for the fish. I came back here that year uh, within a month and um, started trying to figure out how to salt cure and produce the targa. The targa is essentially salt cured mullet roe uh, that's been cured the way that it has been for thousands of years. Uh, throughout Italy you find batarga pasta which is essentially olive oil, garlic, sauteed a little bit and then tossed with hot spaghetti and then a lot of batarga shaved uh, on top of it. In Japan and Taiwan, one little slice of batarga with daikon and sake is a simple way to eat batarga. And, and you can really use it on a lot of things, on salads, just if you want an air of the sea flavor, you can just grate a little bit on top of a salad or greens or on top of a pizza. In 2009 or 10, kind of a foodie, high-end gourmet distributor from New York called me and had heard that we were producing um, Batarga. He invited me to come up, he would like to distribute the product. Uh, that was sort of what spawned the business as to this, as to what it is now into producing Batarga. So we were the first Batarga producer in America. The quality is great and the chefs love it. They lo I, it was sort of perfect timing too, like the food movement was starting then and like, you know, we've sort of ridden that wave I think for the last seven years. But the goal still is, and which is where Healthy Earth comes in, on this bigger picture is for us to brand Florida Gulf Coast mullet row, produce it here, add the value here, pay the fishermen more money, create jobs, create a sense of community around the, the industry and preserve the industry uh, for the future. Jesse Tincher began his career in Miami, one of the top food cities in America. After many years of perfecting his craft at five-star establishments along the East Coast, Jesse was presented with an opportunity to own his own restaurant, and the Blue Dog Bar and Grill and Mullet Madness Monday was born. About mid-summer, you know, when it's just the locals here, everybody's gone, and so it's trying to think of ways, creative ways to come up to better show off mullet. Uh, things you can do with it besides just fry it, blacken it. It deserves more respect than that. And because people out here, that's their livelihood. That's what they do to make a living. And so, they, and it's an ode to them and to show them like, hey, we appreciate what you do. And so I come up with some different ideas. So I came up with Mullet Madness Monday. And I uh, come up with different ideas, like uh, done a Jamaican me crazy mullet. I made a Jamaican brown stew, 
pour over fried mullet with uh, coconut rice and peas and sweet plantains. I've made a smoked mullet empanada, I made smoked mullet spring rolls, egg rolls. Well now Monday it's coming up, I got some good ideas. I'm going to do a mullet with kimchi and also going to do a blackened mullet over pasta with a Cajun crawfish cream sauce. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of things. I've done a mullet Reuben, just like a regular Reuben, but use mullet instead. I've done blackened mullet pizza. That was pretty popular. I've done uh, a Thai curry mullet. Had mullet with a yellow curry sauce with potatoes, pineapple, peppers, onions, with a jasmine rice on the side. I've done a mullet Oscar, and that was a uh, put fresh green beans, pan seared mullet with uh, lump, pine island lump crab meat on top, and then drizzled that with a homemade hollandaise sauce. We do breakfast Saturdays and Sunday mornings from 7.30 to 12, and I do uh, fried mullet and grits, which is a traditional southern fare. And then my fish dip, I'll put my fish dip up against anything. And I get use smoked mullet for that, and it's pretty good. It's limitless, and now, my, like I said, Mondays are my favorite day of the week, and when Tuesday comes around, I was like, it's Tuesday, but it's only six days till Monday. When I came from Miami over there, mullet's bait. And also from the northern people coming down, like the, the seasonal people, and uh, I guess they don't eat mullet up there. And it's an awareness, education. Um, so I'm trying to do my part, like, well, mullet is not just fried. You know, like you do other stuff with it. And it's a, it's a very versatile fish. It's really creative. It's very healthy. It's not just some old cracker kind of fish, which it is. Trying to get it out there that you can do a lot with mullet. I mean, it's like kind of like shrimp, chicken, anything you make a million things out of, you can make a million things out of mullet. A lot of good stuff too. It's every day we talk about mullet, we talk to the guests that come in. Now that we have more seasonal people coming in earlier than what they usually do, and so we hit every single one of them like, you know, we got mullet. Mullet's not bad, give it a shot. Good. We like to call it the mullet face because uh, when they come in, we mention like, oh, especially on Mondays, hey, welcome to Mullet Madness Monday. We're taking mullet to a whole new level. And they give that face like, you know, like and then uh, they want grouper or snapper. Like, I tell you what, try the mullet. If you don't like it, I'll buy it back from you. And sure enough, they try it and they're like, wow, this is really good. So they went from wanting grouper to now they really like mullet. It's just like people know more about mullet. Like I, when I said when I first came over, I really didn't know that much about it. But now that I've been in here and ingrained myself with the community and really got to know and appreciate mullet now. It's like, well, it needs to get out there. I need to get the word out. And I'm trying to do my part to help get the word out about mullet and how great it is. Restaurateur Ed Childs is a force of nature and a true mullet evangelist. A native Floridian, he is keenly aware of the mullet's history, heritage, and importance to the state. Ed loves mullet and he shows his admiration for the fish by featuring it on the menu of The Sandbar, his historic beachfront restaurant on Anna Maria Island. Ed is passionate about converting every customer that enters his restaurant into a lover of mullet, and he also has a plan for the future of the fish. Since the beginning of man and woman walking on two legs in this area, we've been about mullet. So this speaks to our heritage and our values and what our character is in the area. And that's important. What we need to be doing is eating mullet six months of the year, at least, when it's fat. Is when the mullet get fat in late June, we start putting mullet on the menu then. Are you a seafood lover? Have you ever had gray striped mullet? Not mullet, it's gray striped mullet, thank you very much. And if you haven't had it, you've got to have it because you're a seafood lover. And we're going to bring you some because we want you to taste it. And then we want you to go out, what people will do. What? I had mullet. That's good. Yeah, it's real good. It's superb fish because it's robust in flavor. The people that we turn on to this fish love it and come back again and again for it. I don't have to convince Europeans. They get it. They appreciate it. And I'm not sure why there's the disconnect. I just know that we're beating the drum about it and we're excited about it and we're making believers out of people. Everybody wants to do local now, right? Most important movement I've seen in the 36 years that I've been in business is the local food movement that people want to know where their food comes from. 
you know, that chain of custody of the fish. And, you know, so this is about who we are, right? That's branding our area. That's how we tell this story. And it's a very important story. And what we need to do is fully utilize the product. You take the row out. You take the fillets off, you fresh pack them, you can them, you pickle them, you cure them, you dry them, whatever the market. Why are we selling the robe to Taiwan and to Sardinia, where the majority of it goes, so that they can naturally cure it and sell it back to us for up to $200? We're basically selling our treasure for pennies on the dollar. We're, le we're letting them take our heritage selling it to them cheap and then letting them brand it and tell the stories and making all of those step ups in value. So we started the Anna Maria Fish Company to show that there's a better way to do it. This is the one of the ultimate sustainable seafoods. I mean, there just is no question about it. Well, it grows fast. It's a very hardy fish, super healthy. In the only area in the country where there are three national estuaries on our border, where the finest mullet in the world comes from. Why do they buy all this mullet from us? Because it's sandy bottom west Florida mullet. It's not river mullet. It's not bay mullet. It's not muddy. It doesn't have that muddy taste. It's clean. So they get it. We need to get it. And we need to be utilizing all of that because that's economic development here. If you ask the people in Cortez, are their best days ahead of them or behind them? They're going to tell you that their best days are behind them. If they adopt this, their best days can be ahead of them because it's not just the whole mullet, it's the whole mackerel, it's the whole amberjack, it's the sardine, it's the herring, it's these God-given natural resources, this wonderful cornucopia that we have here. As I said, you go back to the very beginning of time here, it's about seafood in this area. So let's be a model, let's be a leader in that. Let's promote, let's take the people that got you know, their livelihoods ripped out from under them and that want to continue to be watermen for, and have been watermen for generations and let's give them a, a, a way to stay on the water and to feed their families and to provide a wonderful, healthy seafood that Florida has been known for and will be continue to be known for. So, as we come to the end of this fish tale, you hopefully have a better understanding and perhaps a greater appreciation for the unheralded and underutilized mullet. If anything else, when someone mentions the word mullet, you will now think of the fish and not the haircut. Can the mullet be the fish of the future? A wonderfully sustainable seafood that can feed families and revive local economies? Will this valuable resource from our own backyard continue to be sent to overseas markets? Or will consumers begin to think local? Perhaps customers will ask for mullet the next time they go to their favorite seafood restaurant. Because only demand can increase supply. As they say in Matt Lachey, eat more mullet. But if you take away nothing else from this story, take comfort in the fact that the next time you and one of your northern friends are looking onto the water and you are asked about that jumping fish out there on the bay, you can say with certain authority and a great deal of local pride, that fish, that's a mullet. See you.
never swallowed my baby. For more on mullet, please visit taleoftwofish.com. Support for WGCU's local productions comes from the estate of Patrick and Rosalie LaSala and from generous contributions by viewers like you. Thank you. To include WGCU in your legacy planning, visit WGCU.org.